I hit start before I, I, you guys were even here. That's my mistake. <laughs> Whoopsies. Anyway. As you can see, I got a new light. Looks much better. There are no measures within the great sleep. You have become unacquainted with time. Boy, do I wish. After a beyond long absence, your mind begins to drip back into your drop. Drip back into your body. A drop per moon, per sun, per turning. You cannot be sure. Eventually, you can feel your flanks moving with each slow breath. Your limbs, your scales, your feathers. When you at last feel your eyes again, you open them to, open them to the darkness briefly. You see nothing, but it is still a minor victory. Suns later, you guess. You are able to drag your claws against the packed wall of dirt sealing you in. You are so weak that you fear you may die here. At last, however, you see signs of light. You are desperately thirsty. Oh my. And so hungry that you cannot even feel your core. But you have survived your first great sleep. You widen the gap and squeeze your body out through it, surprised at the difficulty. Oh, oh my. We're handsome now. Or handsomer. The reason soon becomes clear. You have shed the short limbs and coppery armor of infancy for more colorful colorings, and a larger, sleeker frame. It is almost like having a brand new body. You have left your old life in Heartbone Valley behind completely. The Great Four have put their mark upon you as well. Your armor and feathers have taken on the colors, the elements which you have favored. Already you are unique, different from all other Drak. The sight of your current self Fills you with pride. Quite a long time has passed. Must have passed. But you have endured. The warming earth below your paws. The air flowing over the hilltop. And even the water which you now drink. All taste of adventure. Your world has grown larger. This land. The spirit world. is greater than Heartbone Valley. As you explore and claim its treasures, you will be tested in new ways. With each success and failure, you will learn and grow and be able to take on greater challenges. Prey here is more diverse and also more dangerous. Tiny creatures can no longer sustain you. Tree tails and long ears, squirrels and rabbits, are too small to feel this new body. You must seek larger prey. In time, you will also have to deal with other drakkin. Challengers may attempt to take your lands from you at any time. And the nearby territories have masters of their own. You are still too young to challenge them for their lands, should you desire them but not too young to learn their ways and truths. Set word from your lair. You can barely make out the great tree where rests the spirit of the great. It has accepted your presence, but if you wish to deepen your relationship with it, you must find your way to its home. We are nowhere near ready. The no-tails have no presence in the first forest. Your time here is limited only by your own growth and your ability to protect against those kin who would take it from you. Your infancy is over and your adolescence has begun. Explore, grow strong, and find a treasure. It is only by learning that you will gather the power necessary to become great. Great, like this cheese. A new sun has risen. Your song of life continues. You are very hungry. 
You do not silence another living being and consume it soon. All right. Here's our bed. It's very nice. Very solid. Very good for the back. Unless you're ancient like me. Here's our cave of treasures and wonders. You can spend a day, once again, researching one of your artifacts. You can use the bloodstone, that's this thing right here, to get a massive temporary boost in your fire mastery. But for the most part, we don't need any of that. We go hunting, boys. At our current hunger levels, let's, poke or, let's explore a little bit. We can take a day or two to explore first. Ah, there's a dragon there. This is the approach to the high moor known as the Skyward Reach. Trees and thickets are rarer here, replaced by brown heather, steep slopes, and heavy stones. A tribe of hardy and tasty surefoots resides here. Surefoots, goats. But hints of sulfur on the breeze suggest that you are nearing another kin's domain. Tread softly. I'll let this one play. I'll let this one and the next one play through. Okay, yeah. Let's explore these two. And then I'll go hunting. Oh man, stop! Water is enamored of this area and gathers in countless pools and marshes. Trees melt into tall grasses and cotton-tailed plants. This area is dangerously close to the huge marsh known as the Empire of Reeds, an area claimed by a sapphire kin as its home. You may hunt water beasts here, or request an audience with the Reed Lord, but perhaps other things may also be found in the wet and warm word green. So pretty. I love it. Okay. As I promised, we go a-hunting. Ooh, this might not have been the best choice. Uh, let's go with this one. We're go gonna hunt this ferret. I mean, lesser stink strike. All right, buddy. Nom noms. I went with the ferret first because, well, actually, I'm just going to show you. Also, that cheese was delicious. A death bite tail beast. A snake. You encounter a death bite tail beast foraging for food following the way of its people. Its scent is still free from the pungent smell of fear or even alertness. Wind is neutral and will not affect this hunt. Deal. Get a little bit closer. Get a little bit closelier. It is, as of yet, ignorant of you. Excellent. Let's have snake for dinner. This is why I hunted the ferret first. You need to cook the snake before you eat it, because it has venom inside of it. And you burn a little bit burning it, but then you gain more than you burned. So it's worth it. It has a net gain, and it's worth it to do the burning, but you need energy to do that burning, and I didn't want to risk it. All right, it looks like the wind is... Eh, we're fine.
Come on, come on. There we go. All right. Roasted a little bit. See, we lost one notch, but we gained a four. Okay, that's out of the day. We should be good to, to uh, fully explore the rest of the area. I'm just going to blitz through exploring the rest of the area real fast. Ah, yes. The Great Green! The sacred cathedral of trees, some of which are said to be as old as the Great Green itself, is known to all as the home of the Spirit of the Green. Its name is revered even by the Drac, and is the basis for the name of your entire territory. Only a fool would enter this area. So us. Yes, yes, it's New Day. Once again, one of my favorite things about this game is that I can play it with one hand. My other hand is doing a, eating things. The shallow river's several tendrils give this region its name, the Four Tales. Yep. Bats! Oh, it's getting real batty in here, boys. Uh, what has eyes but needs them not? What has legs but, but does... Oh, I haven't read any of this. That's my mistake. Returning from outing, you stop short of entering your lair. There's a potent smell wafting from the cave, gray-green and odious. Cautiously, you step inside, and looking up, you realize that the ceiling is moving. Little waves rippling across the surface. The cave is full of feather this... Flying fur beasts, shriekers, thousands of them. They sing impossibly high songs to each other in a mesh of sound which tickles your mind. Despite their having been here for only a short time, their leavings cover the floor. Watching you, they seem to be waiting for your next move. You listen to their song. You cannot hear it clearly with your ears, for their songs are too high-pitched, but you hear them in your mind. What has eyes but needs them not? What has legs but does not walk? What has wings but not one feather nor scale? We are the question, and we are the answer. Sweet are we, like the nectar our prayer drink, our prey drinks, from night blooming flowers. From our old to our young flows wisdom, so the colony, our true self changes, yet ever remains the same. New songs are sung, new riddles are forged. Yet all know the glory of flight in the darkling sky. Wisdom we have, if you know how to ask. Treasure we have, if you know how to take. Songs we have, if you have ears to hear. Songs we share, if you know how to sing. This is our way, the good way of the Shriekers. Uh, We're going to uh, challenge them for a treasure. You have treasure, I'm Dragon. Give to me. Perhaps surprisingly, the Shriekers are enthusiastic about the proposition. They huddle, sharing stories and possibilities rapidly among each other, in excited ripples of sound and motion, and then they finally turn to you. Their eldest sings in that sharp, sharp toy, toy? tone at the edge of hearing. The flowers laden with nectar, the clean aroma of night, the fragrance of rain-sweet grasses, all of these are wondrous scents. Tell me then, of all things, what smells best? It is close in, right in front of your very face. I'm not going to lie. <clears throat> My nose. Oh, what smells best? Yeah. The Shriekers, as one, take flight and leave your lair, happily defeated, laughing in their tiny voices at the answer as they sent their way to a new. 
Before it leaves, the eldest from among them teaches you a secret method for extracting fire seed from bat leavings. You collect enough of the stuff afterwards to make what amounts to a wad of pure destruction. Just waiting for a, kindled, a flame to kindle it and unmake nearly anything. You call it a boom for the sound it will surely make. And store it safely away in your trove. We made a grenade! That may not have been the best idea. There is an encounter later on that the Shriekers would have been useful for. Oh well. I don't have that artifact, so. Ahuman! Is that a fire? It is, and we'll get to that. Like I said, I'm just going to try to blitz through searching and exploring and uh, exposing all of the things. <laughs> In this little area, we have four humans, a thing, and... Oh? You know what's real funny about my face cam? My computer is right here. Right here. If I were to turn the face cam, the cam this way, you'd see the computer. That will not happen because I don't have the space. I would prefer that it just be me centered. <laughs> My bed is right here. I am touching my bed. <laughs> ah, wolf, hunting, river, wolf. All right. Uh, we're getting back down into our bottom third of our energy, so we're going to have to hunt pretty fairly soon. We'll hunt again as soon as I'm done clearing out the rest of these. Dragon. Hunting. Uh, I... Oh, I remember this one. I remember that one. I remember it. We will get to that one eventually. I suppose one smart way to do this is to explore an area... Clear out all the events, explore an area, clear out all the events, but you don't have the energy and time for all that. A shooting star! That's a thing. This is a thing for eventually. That's treasure hunting. Excuse me. And we have two more spaces. And then we will hunt again. Sparklers, treasure, and hunting! Last one, I believe. Let's see. Can't even select here, because it'll clear away when this last piece goes. After this, we will go after one of the larger uh, hunter hunts. I'm going to tell you what this is right now. That's a weed. Get out. This right here is an event we will not be doing. Because I do not feel like getting my guy high. Uh, let's start... Ooh, you're at yellow, probably because you're being hunted by dragon over here. That's speaking event. Can start here, but I'd rather jump to here. Lanes runner. A horse, I believe? No. Yeah, a horse. It's a Hans. We've come so close. Oh boy, we're cutting it close. Aha, it still hasn't noticed us. Oh, 
Oh boy, it's still alive. Time to kill it. Your enemy is now injured. You must now prepare yourself for the dance of destruction. Uh, yeah, you're very good at Earth. Let's get burning breath because that's that's too much right now. Oh, bracing for the attack. Oh, that's rude. Come on now. Come on now. There we go. Such a feast! You feel deeply sated. As you meditate on the noble beast essence, you feel inspired to run free, feeling the wind in your feathers and sweeping over your armor. You gained a lot of energy. Uh, let's go again. Oh boy. This one's harder because the wind's against us again. Again? I didn't actually catch the last time. Come on. Aha! The reason I'm going come on on the second time is because the uh, element uh, related to sneaking up and, and preparing to hunt is showing yellow. That means caution, you might be noticed. You might fail. Oh boy, here we go again. Start with this one, because... Aw, oh, you started with green. How rude. <clears throat> right. Let's be quick about this. Wow. I don't think I went over that, actually. Uh... Oh, we can stop hunting for, for a while now, actually. So I believe I went over last time the color orientation based on the rock, paper, scissors elements. Uh, fi water beats fire. Fire beats air. Air beats water. Green is neutral. Green has no effect. Okay, uh, we can... We can poke out over here. Oh, it's the glowing alien ladies again. They barely make any sound as they move from plant to plant, touching a leaf here, caressing a flower there. With their long-fingered forepaws, their small mouths, their movements are measured and slow, as if every step, every gesture was carefully planned. They are brightlings, with their mostly hairless, untailed bodies and stilt-like legs. They bear some resemblance to other seed species, such as the no-tails and the delvers, but they are altogether different in scent and in spirit. A facade of no-tail birther scent cannot hide their true aroma, which is like blackberries and lightning, holding not the slightest trace of decay. Each of their scents are exactly alike. As for their inner essence, you cannot see the element spirit lines of their true selves at all, but rather their whole bodies seem to glow faintly. Are they made entirely of tiny spirit lines, or do they have no true essence at all? Both seem impossible. At the moment, these three are engaged in touching, smelling, and occasionally even tasting every tree and plant they come across. They never destroy anything. They never, er, uh, they, though occasionally they pick up a fallen leaf or pull up a small herb, herb, or flower hole, still with its roots and soil, and place them in a small sphere of melted sand briefly before carefully placing them back where they were. What will you do? Let's just take a look and go, uh, what the fuck are you? Hello, who are you? What are you doing? Hello. As you approach, one notices you, and then all three are suddenly looking at you with piercing violet eyes. 
The first saying no warning to the others, made no sign. How did they know? Is it as though the three share one mind? You see, what you didn't, what we didn't see was them doing. Because you cannot sense where their minds are, you have difficulty singing to them in the usual way. There is no surface upon which to paint your feelings and ideas. However, they do not quail or shy away from you. The scent of fear is wholly absent here, which in itself is more than a little disturbing. As one, they slowly approach you, four paws outstretched. It seems they wish to touch your head. In a moment, their digits will be upon you. What do you do? Curiosity wins. Remain and allow them to poke at you. Despite a feeling of rising fear, you remain stationary and allow them to touch you. You feel a jolt, a spark, as they make content, but you are unhurt. What well, they do, ruffle their feet against the carpet and go, Zzz. They proceed to gently inspect you. Smelling your skin. One even uses a small pink tongue to taste your crown feathers. Lady, lady, lady. Dinner first. Dinner first. Might their tongues be as sensitive as yours? They back away and stand still for several moments, and then return to their prior investigation of the green, ignoring you. Many questions follow you back to your lair. How is it that they neither fear you nor prey upon you? Why did they wish to touch your body? Like the no-tails, the brightlings are mysterious, but their total lack of understandable intentions makes them even more fearful. For standing our ground, we gain Earth Mastery. <sighs> I'm going to need to get more water soon. I'm out. Let's go poke at the wolves. This one. Oh, me, oh my, it seems we've interrupted a meal. That's kind of rude of us. A sleepless night sends you wandering through your domain. In the still dark, a song of victory draws you to the top of a hill. Clan singers, you can barely see their bodies in the early dawn. Moon is gone, and sun has not yet been born. But you smell and hear them with great clarity. Their spirits burn bright. I love this, by the way. The idea that the drac can, can just kind of see how a creature's spirit kind of forms in it around their body. Just the lines that form and the way that the uh, the symbols that appear here kind of sim show uh, kind of sort of their way of life. Their giver chief raises it, its essence stained muzzle and sings a grinding song of warning from deep in its throat. Hear me, scion of the ancient ones. We are the claws of the spirit clan. Many talons united to one paw. By strength and wisdom and the generosity of this plains runner, we share a victory feast well earned. Disturb us not, for we are many in one, and you are but one. What will you do? Ask if they are not afraid of a mighty drac. Indeed, we are afraid. We know you hold red destruction in your mouth, lightly like an adult holds a cub in its jaws. We know that your claws are sharp, your fangs like unbreaking stone. That is why you should fear us. Though afraid, we choose to stand with honor. We see it clearly and know our own hearts. We are many in one, while you are only one. If you doubt, let us dance the final dance. Nah, you guys did all the work. We're out. Bye. Do you leave us to our feast out of fear or out of honor? I'm not an asshole. So you take pride in your lone way, as we take pride in our way of one and many. It is good that time judge with fairness which way is stronger. Spoiler alert. Their way. We learned about the doggies. Uh, excuse me.
Let us go to this wolfie. I'm focusing on the wolves because they can give me something that I want. Wolfie, what are you doing? Your buddies are over there. <clears throat> While exploring your lands, you come across a young warrior of the clan singer people. It is alone and unlike most of its kind. When it senses you, it does not sing to gather its clan. Its body language is cautious, yet respectful. It seems to be leaving its homelands, though you have heard clan singers value their lands and family above all. What will you do? Dude, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> you wordlessly hail the good beast with a plain, unhidden approach. It stops, waiting for you to draw near. There's only a tiny hint of fear in its scent. I am seeks through the boughs. What business has one of the ancient kin with a lone clan singer? What will you do? Ask after the clan singer. The clan singers are proud children of earth and sun. We have knowledge of a great truth. Many can become one. We join together to hunt a greater prey, as all know. Even the great grazers are not safe from us when we see with many eyes. Hear with many ears, and strike with many fangs. When we succeed, we celebrate with crystal pure song, and sleep drunk with warm flesh. But the truth of the many and one goes beyond this. We form bonds with each other in which a new essence is created. The spirit of the clan. Each clan has a different spirit, bound by love, defined by the wisdom of its members. From birth, we are taught not only to survive, but to love. To love our clan to love our prey, to love rich earth and the clear night in the scent of our creators. Our people are found all over the great mother's body, and our song echoes from every green, for proof that we are beloved of earth uh, can never be given. Ask the clan singer why it is leaving the lands of its people. I am loved by my wise brother creator and bold giver creator, and safe in the embrace of my clan. This land is rich and good. Few indeed would leave such wealth. However, it is the way of the clan singers that only the worthy may do the dance of creation. Only the mightiest brother and the mightiest giver may join together to make the future. In this way, we pass down strength to those who come after us. The noble desire to create has arisen within me, and as I am related to the rest of the clan, I must seek out a stranger whose heart I will hunt will hunt mine, and we shall become one, forging a new clan and bringing the song of my people to new lands. Most are content to live and die in their birth clan, but to bravely enter the unknown is the price one must pay if one wishes to pass on their essence. I will create, or I will perish. So have I sworn, sundered the bonds of my birth clan. I am cold and alone now, but I have chosen this path and will walk it with sure paws and clear eyes. So he's decided, all right, family, I'm going to go out and fuck. Bye. Ditching ya. Ask the clan seeker whether it has knowledge of any treasure. Indeed, I know of many treasures. My creators, splits the night and fragrant spirit, are treasures to me. My clanmates, each of them, I treasure in my heart and will never forget. The hill den where I was born is a treasure. The prey I have consumed were all treasures, and this land is a treasure. I hold them all within me, and they can never be lost or taken. It is sung that the kin seek strange treasures, things which cannot show love and which can be stolen away, yet are somehow valuable. If you seek such things, great kin, I know of none. Ask the clan singer why its people sing to the moon. <coughs> We do not sing to moon, that is a false truth. We sing upwards. Yeah, after this day, I'm going to leave you guys to the sound of the sun rising and refill this. We sing upwards so that the sound goes out along the air paths, traveling far before it falls back to blessed earth and other ears. And we sing on the bright moon-drenched nights, for that is when it is easiest to hunt and the land is at its most beautiful. Our praise, though, is not to Moon, but to our honorable, ple honorable prey who has given its life so that we may live, and to our clan, and to Earth, great mother of us all. Goodbye.
May you learn, live, and love, great kin, if love your people can know. I love that last line. You never see nor smell it again. All right, I will be right back. Oh, hang on. Yeah, I will be right back. I'm back. I know you missed me. I mean, don't lie. Hang on a second. Uh, I'm a little chilly. Yeah. A little less chilly. Buddy, like, make me a little less chilly. I should get myself a beer. I don't know if I can afford it, though. Okay. Day, who the fuck cares? Actually, are we keeping track in the lair? I forget. Uh, no. John. Fuck off. Oh, shut up. Uh, let's go poke at the wolves again. Let me back out. Is there another wolf one? Oh, we can go to Tar Dark Tooth. We'll do that after the wolf. Yes. You have found the lair of the clan singers deep in the heart of the Packlands. Most of the clan is out hunting this day, but they have posted a sentry. Its posture and energy leave no absolutely no room for doubt. It is guarding some kind of treasure. Sneaking past it will be an op impossible. Oh yeah, I need I need better water affinity. We'll be back. We'll go here. The trek back to the edge of Dark Tooth's territory takes most of a sun, but once you announce yourself, you are not kept waiting long. Scarcely have the echoes of your song faded when the dark winged elder appears in the sky, gliding down to settle before you. A young kin has survived its first great sleep. No longer a hatchling, though still earth bound, formed and yet yellow malleable like clay. A spirit word, heart of the great green, shall try, temper, teach. Best. But there are other lessons which may not be easily learned from nature. Perhaps a young kin is prepared to begin the great lesson, or does one come for another purpose? Uh. How is my clan singer knowledge? Oh, it is absolutely mastered. Excellent. Great one, what is the great lesson? Beyond all single questions which can be asked, there rest certain truths which reign over reality as the kin reign over all good beasts. The great lesson imparts such truths. It consists of various trials, meals for the mind. One who is found worthy shall have powerful verities revealed which illuminate the path to wisdom. Yet wisdom and power is power, and all power comes at a price. When a young kin feels that the, as though it is worthy and can bring tribute, it may begin. But safety is not guaranteed. 
Truth, like all treasure, can only be earned and never given. Do we have anything that I want to show off to him? Uh, dung that we can make it, that we turned into a bomb. Great one, I'm ready to begin. White burning marks are scored into your mind. Not song sigils, but curves, pathways, swells. It takes you a moment, but you soon realize that these are directions. That curve is a familiar hill, that lie in a great tree you have seen before. You now know the hidden location of the Great Lesson, and can travel there from your lair at any time. Be warned that you may not be able to leave for suns. Only a fool would attempt this adventure without a healthy body and a full core. Let's go! It's a burb! Yes, this is the place. That unusual foreign tree must be the final marker in the mental directions given to you by Darktooth. Here lies the entrance to the Great Lesson. A skyclaw rests on its expectorate tree, watching. As you draw near, it sings. One draws near, pulling away from what it was, towards what it, toward what it shall be. This is the gate of beginning. Its vastness represents all truth, all wisdom. Why are you worthy to enter? What do you possess? Do you know the great truth? No. No. Because the secret is being wise admit is admitting that you are not. Remember always that nothing can be filled unless it is first empty, nothing improved until it finds it is lacking, nothing learned until one admits ignorance with humility and openness. Look down, look down. Looking down at the base of the foreign tree, you see a hole in the ground. It was always there, but it seemed so obvious that the huge stone was the entrance that you did not even notice. It is time to begin the lesson. Let me turn this up a bit so you can hear this. Isn't this music amazing? See? Amazing. This is the maze of history. Though it is not dangerous, or so it is sung, only those who learn the true high story of the Drakkin people shall be worthy to pass on to the maze of philosophy. Time is of the essence in this den, and thorough investigation may take many suns. We go this way. Yeah, All right. Let me let me actually read what what is being said here. Right. Can I not select it again? There it is. All right, we have three options here. I'm going to keep just keep going right. Keep going right. Keep going right. Aha! These freaks. Om. 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 You have discovered a water-laved chamber, but your way forward is barred by three curious beings. They seem to have no eyes and are naked, lacking scales, feathers, or fur. We hear you. We smell you. We welcome you by way of the cosmic sound. Om. This is the gate of what was. The only way forward from the maze of what was. None shall pass us here. Unless. Unless Om. Om, 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 om. Uh, the way forward cannot be seen with the lying eye. Only we know the way to the deeper mysteries. The wise one commands, 
none shall pass unless, unless the high story is sung. How we long to hear it. No song is greater than the high story of the Drakkin, save only the sacred syllable, Om. Those who have seen the seven sights and translated them into true understanding, only such beings may be shown the way downward to the schools. Share what you know of the high story of the Drakkin people. Yeah, I need to actually find. Okay. That's rude. Uh, give me a second. I don't want to be here forever. I just you just uh hang on I'm just taking this real quick and just needs to I needed to get Spotify off my damn computer okay I'm gonna go all the way back to the start for a second okay I am already back at the start okay so right back Left. Ah, oh, shucks. Yep. I'm gonna go back just in case. See if I. Yeah, I have to go this way. I was checking to see if left. It says left is the next option, but I'm just trying to make sure that uh. Left, left, back. Straight. Right. Back. Straight. Yeah, it's still the same. Straight. Left. Back. Right. Back three times, that's one, two, three, then we go to the right, that's yet another day, motherfucker. Yep, mm-hmm, left, left. Right, left, back, right. This can go. Casting your mind back to what you have witnessed in the labyrinth, a story emerges, binding all together. In the beginning. Uh, hang on. Uh, 
panel with the sun above and earth below. I believe that is this one. Earth and sun mated. Earth gave birth to life, whose body was her body, and whose essence was his essence, but whose true soul belonged to neither. Thus the drakkin came into being. This one. I think. Yes. This one. The kin spread across the world, adopting many shapes, many minds, but were always of one essence, and always adhering to the great law of destruction. Which they learned from sun, and the great law of creation, which they learned from earth. They thrived and prospered, and at last one rose over them, elder of elders, first of the first, the queen and empress of all kin. She held destruction itself in her mouth, creation itself in her core, and all lowered themselves in her presence. As you can see, this is back in the time of the dinosaurs. I believe it's this one is next. Let me double check. Then came the others in their circle chariots, and the heavens fell, burning. The very sky turned against the drac, and in brief moments, eons were unmade. The slaughter was unprovoked and unfathomable. Nearly all of the great kin died, though some of the smaller ones survived. Sun shed burning tears which fell to the ground, and earth vomited up slow fire and horror. The great empress was filled with wrath. Calling upon the power of creation, she gave birth to a mighty legion of powerful drakkin. Then using the true sigil of the void, she remade herself as the Ruiner, the most powerful beast ever to exist. Forces of destruction which terrified even the others. In this new form, she led her children into a battle, in the name of Earth herself, for the fate of all good beasts. At first, victory was with the Ruiner Empress, but the others secretly wrought a new weapon, a music which ripped apart reality. This terrible new music of the others bypassed body and even essence to destroy what should never be destroyed. The kin were defeated. Nearly all perished, and the Ruiner Empress was stripped of her spirit crown and authority. Imprisoned deep within the flesh of her own mother, she sleeps through the ages, knowing only the nightmare of rage and sorrow which she still carries in her immortal breast. <laughs> immortal. Having defeated the kin, guardians of Earth, The victorious others created three flat-faced, tailless tribes to spread their dominion. The short, strong delvers to er seize Earth's bounty from within. The wily custodians to tame the great green and gather the treasures of the surface. And the massive enforcers to administer a new law to keep the others weak and docile. The others then departed, promising to return in the future. The few remaining kin slept for long ages in dark, cold places, hiding from the others and their seed.
Though the other seed waited many, many turnings, the others did not return. They grew confused and despondent. In their chaos, the custodians rose up against the enforcers and destroyed them. The delvers disappeared underground, leaving only the custodians to bear the legacy of the others on the surface. They were now simply the no-tails. In time, the few true kin were left merged from hiding and sought their crown again among the good beasts of a new and changed earth. But they were no longer unopposed. Now the new tales multiply, their strange music warping the world, while the kin are squeezed between a departed past and an unknown future. Earth herself, the fate of all of her children, hang uncertain in the silent void, awaiting the verdict of time. Um, or so it was, so it was. The high story has been sung, and the way now opens. We offer gratitude for the pleasure of hearing the Baha'i story once more. Pass on and remember. We gain mastery of elements. This is the maze of philosophy. Several schools teach various truths here. And monitor eels. <coughs> monitor all, all monitors. Hold on. Okay. Challenging those brave or foolish enough to move between one way of thought and another. Both respect and suspicion may serve a young drakkin well in passing through to teach to reach the elder of wisdom. This cavern is vast. Becoming lost would be quite easy. As the trickling waters wipe away even the scent of your passing. Yeah, that stays the same here. We're going to go ahead and focus here. Hello. Water delivers you to a flooded chamber filled with waterbound beasts. They hardly react to your presence, engaged in some kind of group activity. The largest one sings, and the smaller ones echo it. One plus three equals four. One plus three equals four. Momentum is equal to the product of mass and velocity. Cavern 7 features 4,721 4, individual stalactites. Pausing, the large one sucks several of the smaller ones into its giant mouth, then placidly continues. One of the larger waterbound approaches you, singing a soft a so song of soft greeting. Greetings, honored visitor, and welcome to the School of Knowledge. What do you seek here? When you inform it that you have come in search of wisdom, it seems gratified. You have come to the right place. Wisdom is simply another term for knowledge. Here, the instructor imparts crucial information, which should be known by all. Please feel at liberty to join the other students in learning the essential facts of the world. Leaving is not recommended. The monitors do not take kindly to those who leave class before it is properly dismissed. Please note that class has never been dismissed within the collective memory of the beings here present. Enjoy your educational experience. What will you do? Take a lesson. Roots. Ugh. Apparently a root is a number which then, mul which when multiplied by itself gives, an gives another number of which the first number is considered the root. The instructor then proceeds to address the unasked. of whether the root of the number 2 can be expressed as a fraction, that is, as the ratio of any two whole numbers. Math, 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 I'm not reading that. The fact that none of the students seem to truly comprehend the reasoning or significance of this, or even care about it for its own sake, does not stop the instructor from doing the exact same thing all over again with another unasked question and another. In the end, a test is given in which the students are required to repeat various facts and principles. Those who repeat them are well rewarded with food. 
Those who do very poor, very poorly become food. What will you do? Question. I am known as Pedantus. You are quite pedantic. I was once a flat hulk waterbound, sibling of 300 million spawned by my birther parent one son. My existence was filled with hardship and danger, till the wise one chose me and opened my mind to the beauty of facts, of hard, unbiased knowledge. My newfound ability to retain these facts made me useful to the wise one. Now I distribute my knowledge generously to all who would hear. These are the principles of my school, the school of knowledge. First, that only verifiable, quantitative, and unbiased information constitutes fact. Second, that facts are the basis of knowledge. Third, that knowledge is the basis of wisdom. You ask whether the theorems and combinations of numbers and sigils and labels serve a purpose. Of course. Who knows when knowledge of how to calculate the length of the longest leg of a triangle from the lengths of the other two might save one's life. Or when knowing the names of the tiny bones within one's nose may bring one success. But even beyond the facts themselves, what I teach is a better way. A way in which beings are judged on the basis of mind rather than body. From this shall flow a new future. One in which brute force shall become obsolete, fact shall reign supreme. Perhaps in time, one may solve the hidden equation, and all shall be ease and blessedness forever. <sighs> but even if one does not, we create by this new way a more correct and placid earth, where mystery lies dead and all rest in the embrace of certainty. We refrain from pointing out that its way does not seem to be affecting anything at all outside of this small cavern. Take a few moments to watch. Students th survive and thrive by their ability to repeat the myriad lessons of the instructor, and so they obsessively repeat the instructor's song. At various points, the instructor falls asleep, and the students are free to do what they will, but because of the threat of upcoming tests, much of this free time is spent going over what the instructor has previously sung. After tests, most of the content is quickly forgotten, replaced by new material to obsess over. Sound like school yet? Some of the information given by the instructor relates to the realm of nature, such as anatomy. And while a little of it is useful, most of it just applies long names to very specific parts of the body to which you can already refer in much simpler terms. Other times, the information relates to the study of numbers. Math. In fact, only rarely do the learners apply any of, any of facts which they are constantly given in their lesson. When you point this out, they are surprisingly undismayed. Do we not know much more than others, and is not knowledge the root of wisdom? One son, it shall be useful, surely. Besides, in this cavern, our success will be guaranteed if we can survive enough tests. Better to hone one's mind than to rely on one's body for safety. You do notice that more survive here than in the Great Blue by far. <laughs> Ask for the instructor's blessing. It ignores you. Wait for it. Only through a sacred test can my blessing be earned. Since you are not of the school of knowledge, we shall begin with a basic test of number. Add 4 to 11. Subtract 10. What is the result? Subtract 9 from 6, add 6. Oop. Add. Subtract 7, multiply by 7, 63. Uh, 17, 12... 12 times 6. I don't feel like doing that in my head. Minus 7, 65. 17 times 11. No, piss off. I'm not doing that roulette math again in my head. 177. Minus 7. Nope. Oh. 170. Uh... Give me a second.
Your skill in the realm of number is recognized. You have my blessing. Relay my greetings to the wise one and inform it that I continue my sacred charge of spreading knowledge to all. We are smarter. Because we used the power of calculator. Uh. Whoops. Uh. The infinity symbol means we just started over, basically. We go left. We go left. Fucking goddammit, I don't need to be wasting more days here. <laughs> Gosh darn it. Give me a second. And then we go to the right. You arrive at a rocky pool containing an eight-limbed creature. Give me a second. I had to clear my nose for a second. Which seems to be guarding several piles of ordinary sand. Some creatures nearby are doing the same. Welcome, Drakkin. You have traveled far and have at last arrived at the Wanchu School. This is the School of Wealth. And I am Instructor Pecunius. Our philosophy is embraced by all the world. Even the Drakkin live by our way, collecting many, many things to themselves. I currently possess exactly 38 objects. They are mine and mine alone. So, how many objects do you possess? You confess that, although you have many objects in your trove, it does not approach such a number. Ah, the joy indeed is mine today. I can call myself Pecudius, whose wealth is greater than the Drac. It's me and Pen just squirm in pleasure. When you inquire about where these millions of valuable objects are, it replies, Right before your very snout, they are all grains of sand, and they are all mine. Okay. Why, certainly. Normally, I would require a payment in sand, but the pleasure of instructing a mighty kin why, will be reward enough. The first principle of the school of, knowledge, of wealth is this. Only material things are real. Only physical matter can truly be proven to exist and matter is therefore sovereign. Once one disposes of all intangible and ephemeral ideas, one is easily led to the second principle. The purpose of existence is the gathering of material possessions. Having great material wealth affords one respect and security. I need hardly lecture a drakkin on this. In your own culture, mating opportunities are based largely on trove size, a commendable practice. And even lesser beings understand this. Birthers select givers who are of the greatest size, or have the best territory, or who demonstrate dominance over others. All of these are th things are indications of material success, and nothing more nor less. To most beings, success is measured by the collection of vast amounts of food stored in the body as fat. Hey, what are you saying? This is indeed a legitimate form of wealth. Physical and inarguable, but more advanced beings, such as your own people, have moved beyond this and discovered the joy of possessions. Ah, possessions, what pleasure they bring. Uh, the Drax seek possessions with certain characteristics, loosely defined as treasure. But in truth, anything can be hoarded, and anything can have value. Here at the School of Wealth, we have agreed that sand is valuable, and it has created a wonderful, enlightened way... For a certain number of grains of sand, I can compel the beings here present to do nearly anything. Bringing food, cleansing parasites, even the performance of songs and dance. Everything has a price. Morality and ethics, which are non-existent falsehoods spread by the poor, have no place here. Nor in the one song. Even tradition does not truly exist. I urge you to cast away all of these things which are impediments to finding success in the only way which matters. Basically, be rich or suffer. <laughs> Question the use of sand. Ah, youngling, have you still not understood the central truth of the world? Many assume that certain objects have intrinsic value. That is, that certain things are simply more precious by than others by nature. But this is not so. 
All that is required is that others agree that an object has value, such as money. And once that is established, quantity, not quality, is the key. When I first entered this cavern, there was a great deal of sand scattered throughout. I realized I, I could be rich in sand. I ha then had the brilliant idea of gathering it all in one place and guarding it, which in turn made others desire it for their own. The monitors make travel to other caverns perilous, so this is the only sand available. I made it scarce, and therefore valuable. Ah, yes. Supply and demand. It would now be no exaggeration to say that this entire cavern runs on sand. And I have more than any other. What bliss. Jeff Bezos, is that you? Few complained that my hoarding of sand was depriving others of what they needed, such as a soft place to rest or lay eggs, but these were the objections of the weak and unfortunate. They have only themselves to blame for not thinking of it, think of it first. Spend a little time watching. Sand itself seems to be the basis of all activity here. Uh, one sec. The focus is not on living beings, but rather the number of grains of sand which they possess. Every movement and interaction carries a price in sand. It is traded for food, territory, entertainment, and mating opportunities. Reality, is that you? Some of the good beasts here have even forgotten how to hunt, having used sand to gain sustenance their whole lives. Some of you have large quantities of sand, more than enough. But instead of enjoying it, they constantly seek more finding new and more expensive things on which to spend it. In this sense, everyone seems to desire mo much more than they have. This discovery of wealth has made everyone quite poor, and their dependence on other has made them weak, as they now buy what they desire rather than win it. When an individual's pie diminishes, they well with sorrow and become despondent, even though their ancestors, and most currently living beings, would never have cared about it at all. Despite all this, they routinely bless themselves for having created this system and sing about how this is the best possible way. It certainly does allow some who would not survive in the wilderness to thrive, but they are so focused on the cost of objects within the system that they do not perceive the cost of the system itself or the weakness it brings. What will you do? Ask for the blessing. Uh... Everything has a price, O kin. My blessing, like everything else, can be bought with grains of sand. Ten thousand grains, such is my price, and my blessing shall be given. Hmm. As for Cunius, the value of its own life in sand. Millions of grains. Why do you ask? Point out that you are capable of destroying Pecunius and this entire cavern, and suggest that it barter its blessing in exchange for not doing so. Uh, uh... How deeply unethical. I must admit, I expected dragon better from a dragon. Do you not know that it is immoral to harm others when peaceful exi solutions exist? Ah. Remind Pecunius that ethics and morality are intangible and non-existent concepts, according to the School of Wealth. Uh, I give you my blessing. Take it and get out. I will gladly leave, punk-ass bitch. Uh, the current means basically where I need to go. Now we go to the right. That's good! That's good! Following modern protocol! Multiply 11 by 10, add 6, subtract 9. What is the result? Yeah, 11 by 10. I don't feel like doing this in my head. Plus 6, minus 9, 107. Direct. Exceptional out. Lateral movement is discouraged. Please proceed quickly to an approved source of wisdom. Stay in school. Uh, we shall go to the school of emptiness. Oh. This shadowy crevice features quite a few good beasts, mostly waterbound. Living a plant-like existence.
Each seems to have created a hole in the sand for itself, and there it remains, occasionally extending or attracting, but never leaving. None acknowledge your presence. When you introduce yourself as a young Drakkin who has come to learn the ways of wisdom from an instructor, the narrow one in the center replies, What is a Drakkin? You explain that the Drakkin are mighty beasts which prey upon other beings and yada yada yada. Mighty, precious, and immense are all empty of meaning. Many beings you might use the same words to describe themselves, though they are nothing to you or even to me. What is mighty to one is weak to another. What is precious to one is useless to another. What is large to one is tiny to another. You are trapped by judgments of yourself and the world which do not exist. I ask again, what is a Drakkin? Meticulously define every single thing. You say that a drac has a certain number of teeth. If a drac loses a tooth to some misfortune, is it no longer a drac? Then why did you... You reply that of course it is still a drac, even if it loses one or even all of its teeth. Then why did you include that in your definition? Do you not see that all of those points which you labored so greatly to illuminate are false? Exceptions exist for all of them. And yet those who are the exceptions are still drakkin. The more you attempt to define reality to narrow, confine reality to narrow definitions, the more it will define you. I ask again. Using what you what is a drakkin? Describe the unique history. Uh, you speak of events which you have not yourself witnessed. They may well be inaccurate or even wholly fallacious. Yes, you have. I have no way of verifying them, and neither do you. But more importantly, how can speaking of the past define the present? I asked what a drakkin is, not what they have done in the past. Your answer fails to answer the question, and so I ask again. Say that a drakkin is simply what you are. That answer is empty of content. Yeah, if, if you asked me what I am, and I answered, I am myself, you would not be at all satisfied, and the intended question would remain unanswered. Surrender! You do not know what you are, and cannot even define your own species. The same can be said for yourself as an individual, and for anything which you behold in this world. You have failed. Ask it to define itself. You are not an instructor, and I am not your student. You do not have the right to test me. I will, however, be indulgent. I have no definition, and am comfortable with that fact. Any application... Words or judgments to be would limit me, and so I reject them. However, I will note for your people, for your sake, that my people are often called reachers, that I am sometimes labeled an instructor, that others call this place the school of emptiness. These are all labels, and as such are all false, but still others use them. Ask for a lesson. This is the first truth. All judgments are relative therefore meaningless. Consider, to me, a common ray scale is larger than myself, so I may be tempted to judge it to be large. You, though, are larger than any rain scale, and so you may be tempted to perceive it as small. Reality, however, a rain scale is not large or small, it simply is. The same applies to all judgments, hot and cold, low and high, good and bad, intelligent and stupid, beautiful and ugly. All of these are wholly dependent on perspective, therefore do not exist. This is the second truth. All labels are small. Are small? How does words? All labels are false. As you learned, the term drak or kin is often used to describe beings which look or behave somewhat, somewhat like you. But the word drac has no actual definition. We can speak of what is not. A drakkin is not, for example, a fur beast the size of a grain of sand. But we cannot actually define it or anything. We may agree that the term drac applies to you and reacher applies to me, but we cannot actually define what those things themselves are. The nature of objects in and of themselves is unknown and cannot be known. This is the third truth. Reality is unknowable. You have the experience of being here and understanding me. But what if you are now asleep? This is but a dream. Can you prove that it is not so? 
it is even possible that this is a simulation of some kind, and not only do I not physically exist, but even you do not. Perhaps all of this reality is some kind of game for a higher being whose interests and purpose we cannot fathom. How do they know? All things float from dream to waking and from existence to existence fluidly. None of the treasure you hoard nor the prey you consume can be proven to actually exist. These truths alone hold. Who are you? What is wisdom? What is life? You have my blessing. Goodbye. You suck. Okay. Emptiness. And we have to go back this way. Left. Left again. You come to a sandy, shallow pool inhabited by a strange waterbound, relic of a ripe bygone era. It is surrounded by smaller beings who listen to it intently. And lo, the greatest being was filled with wrath for those who dared to defy the law, and it spoke. If thou lovest the surface so greatly, then there sh thou shalt be. Then there shalt thou abide forever. Then unwillingly they shed their scales which fell like sand to the bottom of the great blue and wasted away and perished, floating upwards into the accursed air. This holy miracle, in which the loving and merciful greatest being killed all who disagreed with it, was a sign of the law. Thou shalt not approach the surface. But those who kept the law and did as they were commanded by the greatest being and did not approach the surface were blessed with much food and many eggs. Loki, Loki, lo. Loki Loki Lo! Welcome to the School of Faith. I am Keeper One, instructor of the school. No doubt you are dismayed by the false doctrines of the other so god schools. Here at last the path to true wisdom shall be revealed in the form of the unquestionably correct tradition. You are of course familiar with the concept of tradition, but this does not seem to be the tradition which you know. When you ask for more information, the instructor responds. The basic principles of the School of Faith are simple and elegant. According to the unquestion unquestioningly correct tradition, which has never been and never will be wrong, there is a relatively simple set of principles by which all beings must live. The core of the tradition is the five great laws, which were given by the greatest being to our ancestors long ago. They are as follows. One must met never harm others unless they have broken a law. One must never approach the surface. One must share what one has, if one has more than enough. One must eat nothing which contains the color yellow. One must have faith. Following these primary laws, and the hundreds of smaller laws which proceed from them, has granted us prosperity and happiness. <laughs> Wisdom is defined as adherence to the tradition at all times and in all places. If one keeps the laws, then one will never know fear nor doubt. And when one's body is destroyed, the greatest being will grant one life unending in the starry ocean above. What will you do? The, ask about the greatest being? <sighs> the greatest being is the most supreme entity which could ever be imagined. One may never depict it in detail, for any given detail can be improved upon. The greatest being can never be improved upon. The greatest being made the one song, and everything in it, from the mighty dragkin to the smallest secret beings. The greatest being resides in the starry ocean above us. The stars which shine above us at this very moment are the eyes of every faithful being which has followed the laws, and now lives in blessedness forever. <laughs> points out a few particularly bright points of lights on the cave ceiling. That one there is the eye of a great instructor of the school in the past, and that one belongs to my brother creator. Shining down with love upon me still. Loki, Loki, Loki. You begin to explain that they're just bio worms, but are. Shh, shh, shh. You go, uh, those are bio loose shh, 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 shh. Please do not joke. Those are the, the eyes of the faithful, proof of the rightness of our tradition, 
and not anything else. Certainly not something as base and tasty as a worm. You cannot possibly know otherwise to even approach the surface, let alone rise above it, is forbidden. And this is surely the great blue open to the stars and not an underground pool. Loki, 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 Loki. Following these primary laws and the hundreds of smaller laws which proceed from them has granted us prosperity and happiness. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Uh, skip. We're going to watch them for a moment. Oop. This is certainly an unusual community of good beasts. They greet each other in the name of the greatest being and are careful not to do harm to others. A feeling of solidarity, kinship, and optimism pervades the entire pool. Even if untrue, their belief that those who have gone before are watching them from above tends to modify their behavior in constructive ways. When they encounter difficulty, they often interpret it as a test, excuse me, which reinforces their beliefs and encourages them to act in the best interest of all rather than merely themselves, and helps them feel as though a greater being cares for and watches over them personally in all circumstances. Excessive materialism is almost unknown, and they freely give to each other when in need. They do not worry about changing circumstances, Sure in the knowledge that they are keeping the laws of the greatest being and are protected by its power. There do seem to be a few drawbacks to the system. There are a number of delicious things which can be said to be yellow in some way. They deprive themselves of such things simply because the law commands it, though no reasons are given. When a law is broken, even accidentally, the response can be quite violent. <laughs> So long as the offender continues to profess faith and attempts to adhere to the laws, forgiveness is easy to earn. However, those who openly question the laws themselves, the nature of the stars above, or the existence of the greatest being, are summarily banished from the school. Some make it to other schools, though many are destroyed by the monitors. By and large, however, this is the happiest and most stable community you have encountered. If you are not bound to the way of the drac, you might be tempted to join merely for the sense of support and unity it affords, even knowing that it is based upon factual mistruths. Following these law primary laws and the hundreds of smaller laws, blah, 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 same thing. Uh. Faith is obedience to the tradition even in times of doubt or fear. Many beings attempt to use logic and reason in order to navigate life. This is a serious other error. The one song is too vast and too complex to ever be comprehended by the inherently limited mind. I apologize for the changing voice. I can't decide for this guy. Only the greatest being knows all. Sometimes the individual may perceive something which appears to go against the wisdom of the tradition. But knowing that one is far less than the greatest being, one must surrender doubt and return to the tradition, which is the very word of the greatest being. This is returning is called faith. When you ask why believing in something without evidence is considered a virtue, the, con the instructor responds, The greatest being transcends all logic and is an exception to all of them, except when it is not. So speaks the tradition. Moreover, if faith is abandoned, the community would shatter, and the deep peace we have achieved would be lost. Faith is a morally correct submission by the will of the individual to the will of the transcendent and the basis of social order. Faith is spirituality, morally is spiritually, morally, and socially correct. What are logic, reason to such things, blah, 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 blah. Following these primary laws in the hundreds of blah, 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 faith, faith, faith. <laughs> I wish to bless you in the great being's name, but before I do, you must cleanse yourself. You have been observed not only approaching the surface, but even breaking through it on occasion. This is a grave violation of the law. You explained that, not being waterbound, you cannot breathe in water and must occasionally take an air from the surface. It is not a choice to break the law, but merely your intrinsic nature. Irrelevant. The law supersedes all logic and even nature. If you find true faith, you will be able to breathe water. All things are possible for the greatest being. As penance, you should take the test of the law, as all those who wish to join our school must. I shall question you, and you shall answer. What one must one never approach? The surface. Which of the great laws is that? 
a second. Which of these colors is is not lawful to eat? Chartreuse. Under what circumstance must something be be shared with others? If one has a surplus of it. The fifth law states that one must have faith. Very good. You have learned our way. I give you my blessing. May you carry the teachings of the unquestionably correct way to the ends of the earth. May we meet again in the starry ocean. I will say this is a great way to get a lot of elemental masteries. To the right. To the left. The stone rimmed channels. Bring you before a vast living being. It is clearly water bound in nature, though you have no idea what kind. You have never seen or heard of anything vaguely like it. At first, you fear being devoured, but then you sense its powerful yet gentle essence, and terror turns to awe. Its mind song pours into you like molten shinestone. In the name of wisdom and of the eternal deep, welcome. Imparting a minor truth. This is the gate of graduation, through which all must pass to leave the schools and earn an audience with the wise one. For the purposes of clarification, and also to ascertain the experience of self-knowledge, have you received the blessings of the four instructors, thereby becoming ready for the test? Yes, indeedy. Young one, you have received my blessing, and arrived at the gate of graduation. You have learned the importance of number and fact from my school of knowledge. You have seen how a new way could be forged in which information could be spread from one to many and be used to measure one's worth. Uh, this guy sounds like Hydra. He sounds like he supports Hydra. Get out of here. I will not join you. Because knowledge alone is not wisdom. One second. Then out of darkness, the keeper, keeper one swims into view. Blessings of the greatest being upon you, young dragkin. You have received my blessing. Learn the sacred laws given by the greatest being. You have borne witness to our community of faith and seen the harmony, 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 and peace which come from embracing the, the unarguably correct tradition. When our bodies are destroyed, we will surely live on in the great above and look down upon others from the bright blue stars. I invite you now to take the final step and become one of us forever. If you will swear always to have faith in the greatest being and follow the true laws alone, then you too can live without fear and doubt. Uh, no. But why not? Why would you choose the difficult and lonely path of the Drakkin over the comfortable and supportive community of faith? Hmm. Which one shall I answer? What do you think, chat? Which one shall I give the answer to? All of them are what I want, but... Uh, I'm going to skip out on the first one. I actually like this one the most. Actually, I like this one the most. Because the freedom to seek my own truth is more sacred than the servitude you offer. Greetings, Jackkin. You have made it to the gate of graduation, as I knew you would. Your ambition and power are worthy of your people. Now the time has come for you to join us permanently. We are in need of your strength, and you shall become rich and powerful within our school of wealth. Imagine! You will have such wealth as has never been seen. Other beings will rush to do your bidding, and never again will you have to hunt. For a few hundred grains of sand, others will bring you or your food or even become it. 
You will never have to concern yourself with empty beliefs or agonize over what may be. You can buy pleasure and security, and beyond these things, there is no meaning to life. Uh, I decline. But why? Because some of the greatest treasures of life are those that which cannot be seen. Greetings in the name of emptiness. From me, you have learned a powerful truth that all things are empty. Beauty, ugliness, wisdom, ignorance. None of these things truly exist. They are all relative. All beings are all of them in comparison to certain others. Many search for a meaning to life, but the true meaning is only that there is no meaning. Your scrabbling for treasure, your desire to be strong, you will never have any everything, and you will never be as strong as sun or earth, no matter how hard you try. This cavern is large, dark, and peaceful. It will suffice. I shall not. But there is no forward. The very concept relies upon the idea that there is right or wrong to, way to be, which is judgmental, inaccurate, and harmful to yourself and others. If you move forward from here, you will only be contributing to the morass of action, spinning about in the wheel of destruction and creation, achieving nothing which will not fade with time. Life is not empty, but filled with possibilities. Get lost, you fucking losers. To expand the aspirant's mental perspective, all lessons, all truths are like the great blue possessing an apparent surface, but also harboring vast and secret depths. Most are satisfied with the surface. Few dive beneath to discover the substance, and few st fewer still plumb the depths to find the strands which weave reality. But such is the way of all who are truly wise. While they mo may move within one school, they are never truly of them, and ideas are to them challenges and inspirations, not shackled walls. To acknowledge the truth carried by others, but to also see their own weaknesses, to see all sides of the gem of truth, not fall and not fall in love with merely one of its facets. Such is wisdom. Tenderly, st tenderly stating a final judgment, this place is not your home. You are bound for wider horizons. To express the kinship which exceeds all boundaries of people and mind, may you be blessed. The way is ahead is revealed. You have graduated. Woohoo! We're out of school! It's so... Pretty art. I love this art. I love this game. It's so pretty. The Lair of an Elder. Only in your dreams have you visited such a place. Dark Tooth's ample essence flows in every stone cranny every drop of water. Artifacts of many shapes and colors, some beyond your ability to comprehend, are meticulously arranged in many compartments. Sky claws of the Night Clan fly gracefully to and fro, whispering secrets to their master. And water continuously blesses the huge drac known to many as the Weiss One. As you emerge from the submerged passageway, Darktooth eyes you indulgently, welcome you with a slight inclination of its head and a relaxed half-sweep of its tail. The lesson is... The lesson is concluded. To enter, one must admit that one is not wise. One cannot truly learn unless one embraces one's own limited nature. One then learns the high story of the Drac, you indeed are we who remember the other war and the firefall. Some things should not be forgotten, and so I constructed the maze of what was to pass on what has gone before. Yet be not a slave to the past, which is gone. The present alone is immortal. If one focuses on what was as if it were what is, one will be trapped, unable to find a way forward. Until the last darkness and silence, there is always hope. Both the Drakken and the others, and all beings, can change. Remember this. After the first test, one descends into the maze of philosophy, where one encounters four instructors, each of a different way. In the school of knowledge, one learns that memory and facts have potential to forge a new way, but one must be wise enough to see its flaws. Information without growth or applications is meaningless. 
materialism taught by the school of wealth is indeed conducive to, to acquiring matter, but chasing after wealth and security can easily become a trap. One will never have all things or be perfectly safe. Learning to acquire without learning to let go leads only to pain and fear. Perhaps one would be tempted to join the school of faith to worship their deity and ascribe to their beliefs. Those beliefs, however, are rooted not in truth, but on a desire for acceptance and order, based on a past which has never been. Such is not the way of the Drak kin. In the school of emptiness, the instructor was correct in teaching that all judgments are relative, and many of the concepts we use to label ourselves and others are not real. But while it may be tempting to fall into nihilism, Remember that one is alive, and every act of destruction and creation wrought by you changes the one song. You are at once large and small, beautiful and ugly, wise and ignorant. Embrace that paradox and live. At the Fado Gate, one graduates by refusing to be trapped by any single perspective. Four times but one must reject them, understanding that while all four instructors were intelligent, uh, none were truly wise. Never confuse intelligence for wisdom. Wisdom is neither a knowing nor a finding, but rather a seeking. Seeking? Fuck you! Yeah! This is the essence of the great lesson I have prepared for a young kin. Look beneath life's surfaces. Deep truth is that which connects, not that which separates. Through my growing understanding of the one song, I have crafted artifacts which use the law of reality to achieve ends thought to be impossible. I can imbue my mind song with the power of earth and sun. And yet, though some say that I am wise because of such things, I believe that if I am wise, it is because I have not given up the search for even deeper truths, and am careful to remind myself that I am imperfect, and that there are infinite things I have yet to discover. Answers can become cages. Learn instead to love questions. Certainty can become ignorance. Learn instead to embrace uncertainty, to cherish it like a treasure. Such is my lesson to a young kin. Such is my lesson to you, my creation. Ask Darktooth about itself. The Emerald Flame, your birther creator, was guardian of the spiritwood at the time of your creation. We danced, and so you were created, along with several others. While passionate in its defense of the sacred land, the Emerald Flame was deeply traditional and strong with the element of fire. Its hatred of the no tales was immoderate. Many tailors per perished. It would be no exaggeration to say that the Emerald Flame relished the flavor of their flesh. A dangerous addiction. Finally, on the sun of your hatching, it was destroyed by the No-Tails, who utilized a cunning trap. Just a second. Get rid of these. Now, you are the Emerald Flame's legacy. You possess its territory, as well as most of its form. That is common. Newly created kin nearly always take on the clan of their birther creator. Your scales, feathers, and wings are dense, are deeply reminiscent of my old dance partner. Your eyes alone are mine, and your essence is wholly your own forever. Ask about this trove. What are all these artifacts? What you behold here is but a small portion of my possessions. These are the artifacts currently under research or use. I have several caverns full of small shiny things, and other artifacts in storage at various locations. Most of them in the Great Blue. I am currently involved in a very special research endeavor. Fathom the Great Paragon of the Sea joins me in the search for a different answer. When you ask Darktooth what 
And when you ask what Darktooth is singing an answer to, it falls silent and sings no more. Ask about the creatures of Labyrinth. Yes, he enkindled the ohms, the four instructors. I enkindled them all hundreds of turnings ago. I endowed them with a small part of my own essence, prolonging their lives and granting them special gifts. Each served a minor purpose at the time, but I came to regret what I had done. Enkindled beings are powerful, but their the expansion of their being can easily lead them to madness or destruction. I relocated them here to keep them safe to serve as lessons, not only on philosophy, but also on the dangers of enkindling. Not all of my enkindlings were mad failures like the instructors, however. I was able to guide some, like the sky clawed the entrance to better paths. A few even came to surpass me in some respects. But like the great glider who attends the gate of graduation, I consider it a living treasure. But many more have been lost or spiraled into ruin, sundered from their own people, and burdened with a mind greater than their natures could support. Beware. Ask about the others and their seed. You now know the high story. The others who came from the great breathless above. Usurped our domain. Domain? Dominion. Changed Earth's face. And created the tailless for their own mysterious purposes. They never even attempted to communicate. We were simply, we were simple vermin to them, small things to be eradicated. I believe they were surprised in their way that we were able to mount a significant defense. Against the new music they brandished in the end, though, there could be no victory. Perhaps one in a thousand kin survived, and even fewer now remain. One thing, however, is strange. It is clear that they intended to return. But tens of thousands of turnings have passed, and still they have not. The Delvers and the Tailless, their creators, expected them long ago. Perhaps they will return soon. Perhaps they will return in a thousand thousand turnings. Perhaps they, will, they have been destroyed or forgotten our world. The threat of their return, along with the changes wrought by their creations upon our sacred Mother Earth, hang heavy over us, but hope remains. Learn all you can, and accept nothing as final. Such is my song to a, to a young kin. Ask about the Skyclaws and their relationship with Drak... I keep wanting to say Draktooth. Darktooth. An admirable people. Like all feather beasts, they were kin a long ago, and of all feather beasts, they have re best retained our qualities. After coming to the great green from the great blue, I quickly found that their eyes were as sharp as their talons, and their minds sharper still. I struck a bargain with the white, cl white face clan of the night sky claws, the broad wing clan of the dark sky claws. They serve as my eyes, and I tend to certain other matters on their behalf. More than this, I cannot sing. They have their own secrets, which I am sworn not to betray, even to other kin, for any price. Goodbye. Being in Darktooth's lair is both awesome and terrifying. Your fate is entirely in its control while you are here, even if you are its own creation. You don't know that one false move can mean your doom. Daddy's gonna kill us. Before you even give voice to your desire to leave, Darktooth speaks. Permission to leave is granted. Do not return here again unless asked. I will still answer your summons at the border of my territory, if I will it. And proper tribute is brought, of course. The old ways shall be honored. You have won a subtle yet valuable treasure here. Do not forget the great lesson which I have imparted to you in the form of the Blue Labyrinth. One thing only remains. Take this. The Silver Rod. Payment is not required. 
I do this for my own purposes. If my estimation of the young kin before me is accurate, what results shall be to my benefit? Remember that only by wisdom, the noble and endless quest, may we attain our deepest desires and our truest and our true destiny. Remember that all things are one and joined at the center. Such is my advice to my most promising creation. The sky claws lead you to a hidden passage which leads you back under the open sky, vanishing behind you. Soon you are amongst comforting sights and smells of your own domain. Your own lair and treasure seem like dirt and pebbles in comparison, but perhaps one day you will be an elder such as Darktooth, who possesses treasures and artifacts beyond imagination. But Darktooth's greatest treasure is none of those things. I wonder if we missed the event. You, butthead! It is morning. The dew-chilled breeze and sun's slow glory gradually awaken you. You rise and stretch your body and sluggishly emerge from your, air, your lair. As you exit, the scent of a small fur beast crosses your snout. It is strange for such a creature to be so close to a kin's home. Soon all becomes clear. A squeaking song of enunciation draws your attention to a small bear tail in the undergrowth. When you open your mind to it, it sings a song of great complexity for one of its small kind. It must have been long prepared. Great, great kin, here stands I, small yet winning. For bear tell the tribe, sing I to you. Taken we have from the kin's empty lair, when not there, when not waking. This kin's shiny things. Now hidden away it is, gone from all near places, lost to all but bear tales. For shiny safes return, our enemies you must kill. The deadly legus, invaders of villages, the tail beasts. By their fangs, three pairs, we will be satisfied. What was the Drax will be the Drax again. Quickly, you duck back into your lair. And find that though your artifacts remain safe, many of your small, shiny things are now gone. When you return to the bear tail, it looks you in the eye, unafraid, awaiting your response. Uh, yeah, we'll do it. Yeah... The temptation to destroy this messenger of those who have taken from you is mighty. The fire seed is rising in your throat. With difficulty, you swallow it back down and reply. You risk much, your life, many lives for my treasure, such zeal from one so small. I will entertain your wish, though if you dare take from me again, you will find destruction. Satisfied, the bear tail vanishes into the undergrowth. Each tail beast should have two fangs, and six are needed. The sooner you slay three of them, the sooner you shall have your treasure back. We have gained significant elemental mastery. Here we go. We are just going to hunt for this sun. Just going to kill a bunch of these fucking snakes. And get our stuff back. Silently draw nearer. Slip in a little closer. Kill! Kill! Get our treasure back. How dare those little rats rat our stuff away. I'm going to make it nice and toasty, then eat it. Even with the wind coming at us, uh, we have enough skill in elements to be able to do this pretty easily. I'm not going to lie, it has genuinely been so long since I had done Darktooth's uh, School of Wisdom, that I legitimately forgot half, like, most of it, which is why I had to look up the guides. Because I'm like, oh, what the fuck do I do here again? Oh, hey, the wind is against us, but we're moving forward really fast anyway, because fuck you. We are really, really good at this. Come on, come on. Come on now.
All right. Sick. Three sets of, t of fangs. And we are now completely full on energy. As you return to your lair, you place the final fang in the entrance. When you awaken in the morning, the treasure they stole has been returned. Okay. Oh, pff, I forgot it does that. Uh, you possess a decent collection of shiny things, causing you to feel capable and confident. Uh, we'll go for a while longer, but I do need to close up in a few minutes. I'm thinking about maybe five or ten minutes. Uh, done with Dark Tooth. Uh, not yet. I want to get more strength. Let me grab this. Oh, that felt good. It's a shooting star! It is evening. The dying sun is cradled by the tender horizon. The stars are being born as, as you lie beneath them, enjoying their beauty. You are dazzled by a sudden flash of light. A bright sphere is drawing a streak of light across the sky. A star descending from the great above, screaming as it falls, and you realize it will land in your territory. You find yourself running towards it, a hunter within awakened. The falling star crashes just, just out of sight. You feel the impact in your heart bone. A shockwave of dust and light explodes through the nearby trees. As reality settles from the fall and you emerge from the green, you see before you a crater in the earth, a hole many body lengths wide. The center of it, the was a star, lies nestled and smoking, an offspring of the beyond. The smell is like no fire of this world. Cautiously, tongue flicking outward, you venture down into the center of the pit, one paw at a time. Upon reaching the star, you look more closely at its surface. The beautiful and oddly shaped rock appears riddled with small indentations, glistening and gleaming in the light of a new risen moon. Heaven falls shinestone, a grand treasure indeed, though you have no idea how you will get it back to your lair. You are still admiring it when a strong wind blows and the stars above you are obscured by a huge winged shape. An enormous kin lands on the cusp of the crater. It is several times your size, more massive even than Darktooth. It must be nearly as ancient as Earth herself. Its thick lapis armor smells of brine, and its armor bears ancient scars unaccountable. It stands proud and tall, looking down on you and your treasure to be with eyes of black and gold. Slowly, it reaches out with a warm and soft song. O oh, little childkin, know me, I am Fathom, mate of the great blue, and knower of its inner ways, from turnings beyond thought. Your dry domain is blessed this moon with a fallen sky egg. My truth-drowned mind wishes to reach beyond blessed earth, to know what lies beyond. I have known the lower void, furthest depths of the blue, and now I must know the upper void, the above everlasting. Thus shall I receive from you this fallen star and the wealth and mysteries which lie within. The song is outwardly gentle, but the colors and tone make it clear that it expects you to give over this great treasure. Tradition would dictate that it is yours, having fallen into your territory, but... Politely request a treasure in exchange. The Elder indulgently listens as you fold back your wings in his display of humility and request that tradition be honored with an exchange of goods. You acknowledge that Fathom is powerful enough to take whatever it wishes, but you believe it to be honorable. Fathom said bobs twice, and you are briefly terrified that it will breathe the notorious secret thunder of the sapphire drac upon you, but instead it coughs up a shimmering sphere glistens in the dirt like a perfect miniature moon. This is a pearl born of the discomfort of the voiceless, shaped over many turnings, by secret dwellers of the great blue. 
My trove is rife with these baubles, but in the drylands, such a thing is rare. I offer it in exchange for the sky egg. While much smaller than the... While much smaller the fallen star... I just realized there's a worm wrist in there. It is quite beautiful indeed, and worth many shiny things. The Elder's thought colors make it clear that no better offer will be forthcoming, so you meekly accept the pearl. Satisfied, the Elder seizes the sky fallen object, wrenches it from the ground, and flies off with it, set words into the cool evening air. Your prize is a little too large for you to safely swallow. You carry it back to your lair in your mouth, like an egg, and place it carefully in your trove. You have given up a greater treasure for a lesser one, but at least you have obtained something. Had you attempted to fight the other, you might have lost all, including your life. Considering that truth, you have done well. It looks really cool. It looks like an eyeball, but it looks really cool. I missed a cube because we were down underground. That's okay. Um, I'm actually going to bring some of those back up. We are going to handle this real fast. All right, one moon shone twilight in the deep wood. You come across a bizarre scent trail, like lightning slithered through a bed of herbs. It is a brightling. Hmm. Sorry. One of the mysterious beings who outwardly resemble the tailless and yet have an essence altogether other. Curious, you follow at a distance. The brightling comes to a beautiful grove of trees, and then, much to your surprise, steps directly into the tree and vanishes from both sight and scent, though you can still sense its essence within. As you begin to approach, a night sky claw perched in a nearby branch sings out. Woohoo! Know you of the many lights? Some reveal what is as the light of the sun. Some reveal truth as the light of wisdom. Some are blinding, learning all, tearing all away, leaving darkness in their wake. Which of these lights is the light of the bright ones? Woohoo! Uh, examine these trees. I'm not going to talk to you. They look like trees, smell like trees, feel like trees, taste like trees. Ew, actually. But they do not sound like trees. Do not rustle and creak when the wind blows. The bumpy armor also does not chip nor peel when tested by your claws and teeth. Burn! You focus your inner flame in a brief and forceful breath. Must be careful to scorch, not to set a flame, lest a wildfire begin. Curiously, a part of the burned tree's armor falls away to reveal something. What? It reminds you slightly of sigils, but what will you do? Poke the left scale. What will you do? Poke the left scale again. Touch the right scale. Touch the right scale. Left. Left. Right. Left. Middle. It's essentially an IQ test. The strange markings fade away from the tree's torso, and at first, it seems as though nothing happens. Then you hear a soft but definite thud. Just behind you, you turn about, brushing something with your tail. It is a fruit of some kind. It must have been growing from this strange tree. Oddly, you see no others like it in any of the other trees. It is beautiful. It is treasure. Its skin is uh, as tough as shinestone. Imper imperturbable. Impert imperturbable. And it gleams and glistens in moonlight. It fits comfortably in your mouth, like carrying an egg. And as you make your way back to your lair with it, a warm, pleasant feeling pervades you. It looks fetching beside all of your other treasures. But was it really on the tree the whole time? And if not, then... Woohoo!
Here we go. We're probably gonna end on this little scene. Moon's light is spilling into your rest area, and your thoughts are just beginning to flow into the dreaming, when suddenly you realize that you are not alone. Somehow, a rather attractive kin has penetrated into your very lair from outside. Your feathers puff outward in shock, and your mind reels trying to process how an intruder was able to make it here unnoticed. As you scramble into a threat position, however, you note that the beautiful kin is not making any aggressive movements. Its feathers are laid back and its teeth are unrevealed. Something prods at your mind. And it is a distant relative of the kind of song composed of sigils with which you are familiar, but at the same time clumsier and far more sophisticated somehow. Desire, interaction, desire, communication, desire. What will you do? Let's talk. Hesitantly, you fashion a questioning reply and sing it into the winsome kin's mind, which is strangely difficult to target. Desire, we desire, you. You are attractive. Reward, reward for giving of you. It is walking towards you, but somehow seductively. You become aware of a strange scent in the air, and all of a sudden you are very aware of hot essence building in certain parts of your body. Its movements are, is it the beginning of a dance of creation? You have never done the sacred dance which begets life before. It draws closer and the scent becomes stronger. It stretches its neck forward to lightly touch noses, bleh, to lightly touch noses with you, and then gently licks your crest. You are trembling uncontrollably with... Something. How will you respond? Let's do it! Let's get it on! Baby's first fuck? That baby half fuck. Okay. The scent is intoxicating, and after a short while, any fear has been replaced with a deep desire you had never previously known, stemming from your core and flooding you. Your consciousness seems to fade in and out as instinct drives you to move in strange ways. Finally, you both become one, though you could not explain how. The dance continues for an amount of time. You could not begin to guess. When you at last regain full control of yourself, it is daylight, and there is no sign of any other drac having been there, not even a scent trace. There is, however, a large pile of treasure on the ground just outside your lair. Nuggets of precious shine stone topped with a single beautiful flower. You happily add it all to your trove, except the flower. It is beautiful, but not rare enough to be treasure. Why is it even there? You, Though you remain baffled, you hope that the generous and seductive kin returns. It does not, however. You seem to have profited from the exchange, but there se remains a certain discord within yourself when you remember the event. Who or what was a bright visitor with whom you shared your first dance? We got fucking rich! Alright. I think I'm going to call it there for today. Let us go to our last screen. Shall quit. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you to everyone who has stopped by. Thank you so very much. You've all been fantastic. We are going to go ahead and end it there. YouTube, I will see you again next time.